Cassandra Eve. I'm an astrologer, soul coach and women's retreat facilitator and I'm also the author of Sacred Pathways, Discovering Divine Feminine Archetypes in You. And to support this book I've been recording a series of conscious conversation interviews uh, with women who are living some of the archetypes that are presented in the book. And today I'm really happy to welcome Karen Wilson and we're going to be sharing on the archetype Artemis. So I'm going to read Karen's uh, introduction because there was too much for me to, to memorise. So Karen shares through her business Carly's Garden and she's a wellness advocate and facilitator helping people improve their self-care practice and well-being with the support of vibrational medicine, yoga, meditation and the nature cycles. So the perfect woman to help us uh, to explore Artemis. So welcome, Karen. Thank you, Cassandra. And uh, thank you for, for giving me this opportunity. Um, reading your book really brought that Artemis to life and real, made me realise actually how she's been there all my life. <laughs> oh, how wonderful. I love it. I love it when that happens, that we know these divine feminine energies in us, but we, we don't necessarily have the framework to kind of understand or, or to even accept and acknowledge that that connection is so vibrant and alive in us absolutely yeah yeah brilliant thank you for sharing that so artemis who is she well that's what we're going to explore in this interview but i just want to start with some some pointers in terms of um what she represents so artemis is a moon goddess she's also the wild one the one that's connected to nature to the wild places and to animals. She's known as a virgin goddess. So the virgin goddesses are the archetypes that are complete within themselves. So they're not necessarily, a relationship isn't their focus. Although for Artemis, the relationship of sisterhood is her primary focus. And we will explore how that expresses through her in different ways. One of the, the main features of this archetype is her extremes. Because she's the wild one, she's connected with nature. She's very associated with freedom and independence and self-belonging. And yet she's also a moon goddess. And as a moon goddess, which we will explore more as we move through this interview, she's very inward as well so she she can show us where we can um, integrate those two aspects of our nature the activist the independent the freedom loving the pioneering and that very inward reflected uh, withdrawn aspect of our nature where we are called to go inward in order to recharge now, in terms of her mythology, Artemis is one of the Greek pantheon, the, the Olympians, and she was the daughter of Zeus, who was kind of the head honcho god. He's also known as Jupiter in astrology and mythology. And Leto, and Leto is one of the Titan goddesses. And uh, Artemis is introduced to us through her myth in terms of being the firstborn of Zeus and Leto. And she was born apparently on the island of Sicily. And as soon as she was born, she was one of a twin. She was supporting her mother in birthing her twin brother. And her twin brother is Apollo, the sun god, also known as Helios. But there's a kind of very mythic, vengeful energy around this myth because Leto was uh, the consort of Zeus, but his wife was Juno or Hera. 
And she was very vengeful in her need to make life very difficult for those dalliances that Zeus had with other mortal women or other goddesses. So she made the labor with Apollo, the sun god, very, very challenging. And in that labor, Leto had to uh, escape with Artemis, who was newborn, but somehow because she was the daughter of a god and goddess, was able to facilitate, you know, her um, the physicality of making a move. They went to Delos, one of the Greek islands, where Leto eventually gave birth to Apollo, the sun god, assisted by her daughter Artemis. So Artemis has this association with childhood, uh, childbirth, childhood, and supporting her mother in birthing the son, which, you know, it's quite a task really, isn't it, to birth the son. So her origins lie in some of the deeper ancient goddesses of Asia Minor, because the Greek and Roman mythology tended to sanitize the goddess energies, as this was the time of patriarchy being established. So Karen, I want to ask you about that connection with nature because Artemis as just a young girl, apparently she was three years old according to the myth, went to her father's use and said, I want to be the goddess of the wilderness. I want you to grant me a tract of forest and wilderness uh, that can be mine alone that I can share with my sisters and the animals. And so she knew very clearly what she wanted and her father Zeus granted her that. So how was that connection with nature for you as a, as a child and, and as a young woman? Well, although I grew up in London, I spent a long time uh, living on the edge of Epping Forest. And I've always loved animals since and nature since I was tiny. My uncle, I remember teaching me to draw flowers when I was really little. But growing up in the forest, you know, this before the days of mobile phones and, and all those sorts of things, especially in the summertime, I would disappear off into the forest with friends for hours. As long as we were back by, by dark, that was it. And I was never a particularly girly girl. I loved climbing trees. I would be lying in the grass watching grasshoppers, you know, building dens. So there's always been that connection ever since I was little. Um, I've always loved the moon. I used to sit outside and, and look at the moon and talk to the moon as a child, apparently. Um, so it's always really been part of my life. I became a vegetarian quite young, much to my mother's outrage really uh, because I didn't want to eat animals um, as a teenager I was thrown out of biology class for re refusing to dissect a cricket I think it was um, although I then actually went on into a, a career uh, in behavioral ecology and studied animals in the wild um, and you know really I suppose whenever I realise I am disconnecting, I return to nature. That's my place. That's where I can reconnect with myself. Um, and it's just always been there. I've not always followed that call at times in my life, but certainly now it's it's very much an important part of my being and mm. my well-being. Mm. That's 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 wonderful, and I feel you know part of our cultural shift at the moment is that is that reconnection for those human beings who've lost connection is to reconnect with nature and and um and to understand our oneness as part of an aspect of nature not beyond nature but actually an aspect of of nature on on planet earth and you know i recall too that that amazing freedom in my childhood of being able to you know kind of being kicked out of home with sandwiches after breakfast and told to disappear with my brother and sister and to just go off and explore nature you know the moors or the ocean or whatever it was wherever we were because we moved a lot as uh, during my childhood and how profound 
that was. And maybe, you know, perhaps that's something that in this increasingly technological age that we're, we're reconnecting with and that children are reconnecting with through their families now through this latest uh, circumstance of our collective evolution. It's interesting you spoke about the, the dissection because I, I had this sudden memory of refusing to dissect a frog in, in biology. You know, same thing. It was just abhorrent to me that we were using this animal um, in a process of learning, but how essential was that? Could we not learn in, in other ways? So yeah, that, that Artemis is strong in terms of being very clear about what's true in terms of nature, animals, ecology, and, and so on. Um, and just stating that fact, you know, she's bold in, in that. So that, that play, that gathering with friends, you know, it, for many of us, it can encompass the role of being a sister. So for me, I'm the sister of twins. So, and I was the big sister and that's, or, or I am the big sister still. And that's a role that Artemis plays. So how did that role play out in your in your younger years was it was it an aspect of of, of your life i think it was not not in in terms of me i'm actually the youngest of three girls um there's a big age gap between me and and my next sister and i actually didn't know my eldest sister very well growing up because she was in the forces um, but certainly the middle one of us was like my second mother. My mum always used to laugh that she used to have to fight to, to give me a bath and, and things when I was tiny because my sister was always involved. And she actually went on to become a nursery nurse and a specialist nursery nurse as well. And I think one of the things that really struck me growing up is my father died when, when I was young. I I'd just turned 12. And that actually coincided with my sister leaving home. So it was very much, you know, like I lost two really important people at the same time. And, you know, for, for my mother at, at that point, the amount that she had to work to, to keep us going meant that she wasn't always available to me. So, you know, as I grew into my teens, I became an incredibly rebellious teenager, um, very independent, um, didn't want help from anybody. Um, I became a real activist and I still am, but, but back then, you know, it's like I'd be going on demonstrations and, and so on. Um, but always very much felt an outsider as well you know I, I, I was a punk we were an outsider group <laughs> um, but uh, not having my big sister at that point in my life I think was really quite profound um, and, and had you know it took a long time really for, for us all to reconnect um, you know as adults I think because I felt that sense of abandonment and it's it was I think then I became that little warrior. It's, I don't need anybody. I'm fine by myself. <laughs> Just give me what I need and I'll go. Um, a little bit like Artemis, although obviously a little older <laughs> before I knew what I wanted. So, so yeah. Um, but then obviously as, as time got, has gone on, you know, changes in my career have, have meant I have taken on almost that big sister role um certainly as a social worker um i would find some younger and it's a very female dominated profession as you'll know um younger social workers would seek me out they would seek my counsel you know they'd come and offload and just the nature of, of social work as well brings out that really kind of strong protective element um i worked you know obviously that it, you know protecting children from from their life experiences, but also once they become looked after, you become their strongest advocate. Um, I had quite a reputation as a frontline social worker of, of really fighting for what children needed that I was responsible for. Um, 
and, and, and was quite a force to be reckoned with at times. But I also worked with young women who'd been sexually exploited and finding that balance between that fierce protection of them and the rage that I felt to, to people who'd abused them and trying to balance that with remaining detached, remaining professional could be really difficult, really tough at times. But, you know, it, you know I, I've had moments where I've stood in the middle of a street when I've known children have been in a flat and literally bellowed, um, you know, and, and taking those risks really to protect children who aren't in a position to protect themselves. Mm, that, that's, that's profound. And it's interesting how, you know, what I was seeing was this synergy between your experience of that loss at age 12. In a way, you know, the way I, the image I received was like you were kind of catapulted in trying to, in having to find this, this strength and this truth and this fight in you that then, you know, proceeded to develop over time, particularly through your work as a social worker, into being uh, an advocate and, to, and being a fighter for, for what's, what's right. Mm. And it's interesting to see how that theme developed, that external arch, arch, archetype of Artemis, you know, with her bow and her, her arrow and, and her fierce protection of her sisters and the animals and her forest. Mm you know, how, how that strength and that fire is part of what I call her, you know, our connection to our emotional thermostat, which we'll look at a, a bit a bit later, because it can move to an extreme, which is why we need the moon side of mm -hmm. uh, nature as well for Artemis to be fully developed in her. And I'm just going to read a piece in my book now about that that more inward nature of Artemis and then we can explore that so, so I'm going to start actually with the sisterhood bit so our experience of sisterhood or lack of it begins in our family or childhood environment are you a big sister a little sister or do you know sisterhood through friendship? Because I see it, it, it kind of evolves in all those places, doesn't it? Mm. These roles are very different, yet they all contain elements of the Artemis archetype. Sisters may support and advise, protect and guide, or fight and fall out. But it's a crucial relationship to our development as women. In the family, it's a relationship where you experiment and learn about loving, supportive connection and boundaries, perhaps. The archetype of big sister acts as a role model, one way or another. In a healthy sister relationship, whether with a sibling or friend, we can test the edges of what's real or not. There's an opportunity to learn about conflict resolution. We can experiment. We can go places we can't with a mother, yet potentially we can receive an equally deep loving connection. The oldest girl in the family often has to fight parental boundaries for her siblings. She's the tester pushing the edge of imposed rules, especially around socializing and dating. This is where Artemis comes out to play if she's a strong archetype. She stands up for what she wants, particularly for what's fair. She rebels, she questions and demands. So by the time her sister reaches the same challenge, she has an easier time. Both child and parents have potentially grown through the struggles and tests of the teen upheaval. Artemis's shoulders are broad. She can handle this buck the system teenage role, for it's where her strengths and gifts may naturally accomplish change. Artemis likes a good fight or the struggle to change the status quo. Artemis' protective nature also extends to safeguarding the sexual innocence of the young, protecting young runaways or those who live on the edges of society. Her feminist values grow ferocious when in the presence of abuse. 
her moon sensitivity picks up the most subtle vibrations of sexual misalignment or intent. She holds the gift of a deep instinctual alertness that we need in order to survive. Her animal connection reflects how animal instinct is still keen within her, like a lioness protecting her young. Artemis does not hesitate to act in defense of herself or her sisters. It comes very naturally to her and to us if her, her archetype is strong in us. This combination of sensitivity, alertness and ferocity are similar in nature to that of the animals she loves. It's the wild primal edge of our animal nature that civilization has called us to grow beyond and yes, yet it's a quality we need. At times this animal nature in us is obvious. For instance, when the hairs on the back of the neck stand up. Other times it's far more subtle and involves the psychic senses as well as the physical. It may simply be a feeling that something is off. We do well to trust these subtle and not so subtle signals for its Artemis calling. So before I read the piece about the moon, actually, I'd just like to expand on that with you, that when you were in that kind of rebellious teen and then later on, as, as you know, that took you, that strength took you into social work, were you aware of that more subtle realm, that, that sensitive realm? Yeah, I think so, because I think... Um certainly one of the things as a social worker you need to be aware of is is not just what's being said but what's not being said and and actually tuning into that um and and certainly you know there have been times when talking to children where i felt something from them and when i've asked it as a question they sort of look at me and say, how did you know that? You know, um, so it is about picking up on, on all of those signals and, and subtleties really. Um, and again, you know, I, I'm not actually in social work now, but it's still very much an important element of what I do is, is picking up on those subtle senses, um, whether it's, you know, in my day job or whether it's working with people because sometimes we're not always very good at actually articulating our feelings, but we can express them and we can pick up on other people's feelings that way. Um, so yes, there's absolutely that, that balance between the, 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 you know, the, the very overt protective quality, but also tapping into that quietness to actually find out what's going on underneath that's that balance is always there for me yeah yeah that's uh, it's really really important isn't it and I see how through my own life you know part of the journey has been acknowledging the veracity you know the truth of that sensitivity of what I'm connecting to and and giving it credence and that has taken a lot of growth over the years to actually to, to validate and to acknowledge the unseen and to ask questions about that and to be bold enough to, to say the things that, that are in the field that aren't necessarily being spoken about that, that come from that sensitivity. But then also there is that, that question of um, the timing of our experience and our gifts in terms of a, a rebalancing. And I know you've been through quite a traumatic process with that mm -hmm. over the years. And uh, I want to ask you about that in a moment, but first I am gonna read the, the piece about um, Artemis moon sensitivity. So as sister to sun god Apollo, it seems natural that Artemis would be associated with the moon. This moon goddess aspect is connected to her virginity, much like the sickle moon represents the newly emerging maiden phase of the moon cycle. Artemis moon qualities are those of the sickle moon, renewed from its meeting with the sun at new moon. This phase represents what is emerging for the next full moon phase. 
one could call it a youthful moon, its qualities being subtlety, numinosity and intuition. This moon aspect is connected to the process of emergence in the natural world, seedlings, birth, the birth of young animals and human children. At this time, the new form is vulnerable, requiring protection. This is Artemis' role. The sickle moon is one of emerging light. In the natural world at night, it casts a subtle light on the environment. This light is muted and mysterious. Nothing can be seen clearly. Navigation has to be through intuition, sensing and feeling, allowing instinct to guide the way. Artemis represents these same qualities within. Like in the world of dreams, we don't see the inner terrain with our eyes. When a new form of life or self-expression is emerging through us, we cannot at first know how it will manifest. Our need is to be delicate with this vulnerable stage of a process, to navigate by our moon nature, to protect the intangible form that is opening, to allow it to find its natural way of being. This phase of the moon, although emerging, also represents our hidden needs for seclusion and privacy. What is tender and budding needs to be self safeguarded and held close. In her moon goddess form, Artemis is protector of the newness of this budding moon. She holds that which is unseen, indistinct and intangible. She guides us to recognize our inner wild nature in its rhythmic connection to moon and natural cycles the flow from silence to wild, full chaos. So Artemis naturally in her development in us and also the development of other archetypes within us will call us to times of real retreat where actually everything in the external world can apparently fall apart that calls us to that that new beginning that the new moon represents. And we can't know necessarily when everything's falling apart in, ch in challenges, as is happening collectively now, how that new moon, that new energy looks. We don't know, we just have to kind of follow the clues. Now, I know in your life, you had a, a time when there was a big retreat from life, from the world needed through your health. So can you share with us some of uh, what you experienced at that time? Yeah, I mean, I, um, I don't have children of my own. So work has always been very, very important. And as a result of that, I wasn't always the best at self care. Um, and then I had a big wake up call, which was when I was diagnosed with cancer. Um, and initially, you know, my view was, oh, I'll oh, come back to work as soon as possible. Um, at the time, I didn't think I was going to go through chemotherapy. And when I was told that, I'll see how the first cycle goes. And then it kind of hit me really, really hard that actually, no, I did need to stop. I did need to retreat. And actually, I needed to put myself first and not worry about work because work will always be there. Somebody else will do it if I'm not there. And I think it was that time that made me really look inward um, and really reconnect with that intuitive side of things. Um, both as a behavioral ecologist and as a social worker, very much it, it's all based in evidence and facts and science and methodology and all those sorts of things and it, it kind of pushes away that intuitive knowing that we all have although I would tap into it you know I, I'd kind of suppressed it so the experience of going through treatment really enabled me to reconnect with that and it was like it took me back full circle really um, I'd used flower essences during my teenage years but I hadn't used them 
as, as an adult. Um, I was first introduced to yoga um, when I was about 12, 13, and, and I'd actually just trained to be a yoga teacher before I was diagnosed. And it was almost like, you know, on the one hand, I had all the, the, the medical interventions and treatments um, and the conventional path, but it suddenly became so important that I started tapping into natural forms of support. So I returned to essences and really because I, I was very anemic and felt awful, I couldn't do much yoga, but what I did do was really deepen my meditation practice. And they are things that now I fiercely defend as part of my, my daily routine because they are so important. The act of taking an essence is, is like a, a ritual of checking in. Um, and, and those things are really, really important so that I don't lose sight of that self-care and I don't get back on that hamster wheel of work. And, you know, I became the wild child again, really, but with the benefit of the wisdom of age, <laughs> which was wonderful to recognize that. It's like, oh, there, there is the child that, that used to play in the forest all the time, you know. Um, and being in nature was a big part of my healing process. And, and really that, you know, that, that was the source of Carly's garden. Um, you know, I, I, I retrained as an essence practitioner and, and I'm also doing other training in vibrational medicine now in crystals and sound. Um, you know, and, and I think my experience and that huge realization that actually, if we don't take care of ourselves, we can't be the best we can be for others. You know, it, it was that that really made me want to develop that mission of, of helping other people develop those skills. I have so many people who say, I don't have time to do all that stuff. Uh, and my answer now is, so what would make you take that time? Would it be a diagnosis like I've had? Because actually we know that stress does cause so many chronic illnesses and it's, do you want to get to that stage or actually do you want to be more proactive? Do you want to sit, you know, shut down and, and tune in with yourself? And I think it's made me so much more aware of, of my kind of cycles. You know, I've been through menopause. I don't have that, that physical emanation of, of, of cycles, but I am aware of the ebbs and flows. I am aware, you know, I know when I need to retreat because I'll, I'll, I'll notice that I'm becoming irritable with people. I'm becoming less tolerant of people. And I am naturally an introvert. I need those times of quiet. And, and it's being far more aware of that. And I think that's so important, um, you know, for, for my well-being. Um, and, you know, it was horrendous to go through that. But actually, it was an absolute gift and a blessing. In, in many ways, because it has profoundly changed my life in so many ways. Mm. It's, it's kind of a, you know, I'm really touched by, by what you're sharing because, you know, I'm a great believer. It's not a strong enough word, actually, but I know through my own experience that journey of into the darkness brings us to the light if we travel well mm. through the darkness and we and we receive its gifts and that might look different for for each of us but what a profound gift that is you know what a profound harvest that is to come so deeply in touch you know with yourself through something that that must have been quite traumatic at, at times in terms of what you had to experience with with your body and um how wonderfully Artemis brings us in touch with both sides of, of her nature and has brought you to the point now where, you know, you're sharing your gifts through Carly's garden. So that, that wisdom that's come through your own experience, I'm really intrigued how that works in terms of the vibrational uh, essences and, you know, the rhythms of, of, the energy that you allow to guide you. So can you share a little bit about that, that process? 
I think a lot of it is about tuning in with people. Um, vibrational medicine is, is wonderful. It's so subtle, but so profound. And it very much, you know, interweaves with yoga and understanding of the subtle bodies and the chakra system. And when I, when I spend time with somebody, I spend a lot of time listening to what they're saying and listening to the bits in between that they're not saying. And then quite often what I will do is, is just sit and feel what I feel that person needs. And sometimes, you know, especially if I'm just focusing, if somebody's not used essences before, then I, I tend to work with the back flower remedies that, that most people have heard of. And sometimes they'll, they'll immediately pop into my head, this person needs such and such. But sometimes it's a little bit more subtle than that. And the wonderful thing about essences is, especially with, with the, the back flower remedies, is that they are so gentle and they help us to sort of start dissolving those surface patterns that we have that don't serve us. And then we can move on to, to some of the deeper acting essences that can start really going into the core of it, our issues. And that, that's not easy for people, that can be quite difficult. And so it's about being able to hold that space and, and being able to enable others to feel safely held in that. Um, because I think it's so important that we, we do look at our shadow sides and, and how it manifests. Um, because we understand our patterns in the present, the more that we understand our shadows. Um, and, and vibrational medicine is wonderful for all of those things in a, in a very gentle way. And it, it's not, you know, it's not, um, it doesn't, it shouldn't become unmanageable if, you know, if, if people want to use vibrational medicine. And, and the same with sound healing, you know, the, the fact that everything works on our frequencies, um, you know, in, in such a gentle yet profound way is, is magical. And, and if nothing else, holding space for somebody gives them that right to take time for themselves, which is also really important, I think. Um, and sometimes that's what people say to me. She said, actually, I don't, I don't care if, if the essences don't do anything. I feel I've been listened to. And I think as women, we are really quite poor sometimes at doing things like that. We listen to everybody else, but we don't often listen to our own needs because we're too busy, <laughs> too busy meeting everybody else's needs. And that's part of, you know, my real mission with, with what I do. Um, and the, and the, the wonderful thing as well, you know, you can, you can use these vibrational medicines alongside anything else safely. Um, there are very few circumstances and I'm very clear about circumstances where perhaps I wouldn't offer that support without oversight by somebody else as well. But there's so much we can do as well, just, you know, that doesn't cost us anything you know, working with nature, spending time in nature, connecting with nature. And as you said, I think it is something that perhaps people are beginning to rediscover, you know, and, and I think it helps us find perspective that we are part of something bigger. We're not separate from, you know, we're, we're part of that wholeness. And I think that vibrational medicines like essences help us to, to refine that wholeness in ourselves as well mm, well that's so important and the one thing that struck me as you were speaking was how you know the essences are, are of a similar energy in the way that they work to Artemis in that they're very very gentle you know that inward kind of moon energy particularly mm. that early moon when it's you know opening the space for something new and then the, the power and the and the and the depth of that they that they work at, you know, and how they work with the body, 
they work with the system you know in in every way in every frequency to to be with and to move on what's ready to be moved on you know i i love homeopathy i love essences flower essences i, I use both and i i also suggest them to clients where that's important and um it works in terms of my work it works as a as a support as well in terms of it be, not being so di directly um, available. So, yeah, very powerful in terms of its potency, vibrational medicine, because I feel that's one of the biggest shifts that we can make as human beings in understanding how everything is energy, including ourselves. Mm. Absolutely. And, and what I often find as well when I'm using essences is that I, I don't always notice that shift straight away. It, it might be when something happens a couple of months down the line and it's a, that I realise that I'm responding in a completely different way than I might have done. Um, I almost get jealous sometimes when people say, you know, they start taking an essence and, and this happens and that happens. And it's like, I don't feel that. But actually, I notice the shift in a more subtle way. And, and that's how, how profound they are, I think, for me. Um, and, and, and as well with people who are very sceptical about essences, that actually when they notice the shifts, they realize just how profound essences can be mm. and they work very naturally which is mm. so beautiful there's no doing involved there's no fixing involved you know it's just naturally helping our systems to dissolve and and kind of cultivate bring in what's what's next what's new what's needed yeah mm. i love them so I've spoken about Artemis as being uh, an indicator or symbolic of our emotional thermostat. So our capacity to go to extremes, either in our external expression or in withdrawal and retreat. So I'm just going to read a piece about uh, from my book about, about that. Artemis is a protector and advocate of sisterhood and a warrior. She has an independent spirit. In her shadow play, however, those qualities when taken too far can become disempowering or domineering. Artemis always means well, without doubt she's up for a challenge, especially on another's behalf. Yet it's a fine line between being a protector, an enabler, and the one who takes over. It needs a conscious balance and awareness of the boundary between self and another that the Artemis moon nature may find challenging. Where to draw the line is a key quality to be aware of when this archetype is strong in us, as is wisdom about where, about where the fight is no longer of use, when withdrawal is the wiser option. This is where the twin nature of Artemis calls us to growth in sensitivity to discern, does this now require deeper reflection and a pause or more focused action? When we explore any duality, we might see the swing between extremes can always become a shadow element. The full moon shows us this, when the sun and moon are diametrically opposed, when ocean tides are high, we may be pulled into more dramatic behavior. Artemis's need of solitude and quiet, combined with her independent nature, can also move into extremes. Independence can become aloofness that disconnects this archetype from her sisters. Her strong warrior spirit in competitive nature can separate her from the group, taking the role of a leader rather than a companion. Here, one of the masks of feminism we're in this together, but don't you dare stand out more than me, reveals how competition still lies at the root of many sister connections. It's a legacy of patriarchy that we're still healing. 
We see this particularly in the teen phase of maturing that Artemis so keenly represents. It lives in the need to have a special friend and or a tribe and to exclude those who don't fit. It exists in the constantly changing alliances of adolescent female friendship. Artemis' moon nature also reveals the potential for immaturity to shadow all her relationships. She represents maiden moon, the undeveloped aspect of the moon nature that's full of potential and potency, yet lacks experience. She has no knowing of the mother or crone phases of life the wisdom that flows from deep nurturing, caring, letting go, and the hands-off detachment of a grandmother. The new moon energies always emerge as vibrant possibility. Artemis carries this fresh impulse and drive for newness that can become a forceful push for change, if not engaged with awareness. How far to take this may be a constant questioning that grows in this archetype. Artemis twin nature of forthright independence and numinous withdrawal, call to be constantly refined through walking the fine line of inner reflection and action. It is only in walking that line that we stay connected at the core fueling our Artemis quest from deep truth rather than simply looking for a, a fight or a flight, as I so nearly said. So what would you say to any woman listening about the natural way in terms of responding to these extremes that we can experience? Oh, um... It was interesting you saying that and made me think of all the times in my younger years where I haven't stopped to think first. <laughs> and, and I think that is, you know, one of the biggest things that, that as women um, can be really helpful is, is be learning to become responsive and not reactive. Um, it certainly has cost me dearly when I have reacted in the past, in, including a whole career uh, disappearing. I think it's about really listening to our inner wisdom um, and ourself and, and, and making, being really clear about our own boundaries, both for ourselves and for others, because by doing so, we can navigate conflict in a more productive way, I think, by making our own needs clear um, and communicating them. Um, and I just think there are so many tools that we can help you, you know, use to help ourselves actually become more aware of, of those extremes. Um, even if it is something as simple as, as, you know, working with moon cycles and just doing that tapping in and, you know, if, if, if a woman is still menstruating, actually understanding that in terms of their own cycles and, and how it can be supportive and understanding that we need to honour our own cycles and, and just finding those, those ways that help us to, to balance and to empower ourselves and, and those around us, really. Um, you know, it is that checking in. It is using the tools that we have to support that. Um, and being kind to ourselves as well. You know, as, as women, we, we spend our lives trying to juggle so many things. And I think, you know, in our roles as patriarch has grown in, in modern times is we have to, have to be everything to everybody. We have to be the successful career woman. We have to be the mother. We have to be the nurturer. And actually we lose ourselves in that. So I think, you know, by finding those natural ways, we learn to find to nourish ourselves. And, and from that point, then we are able to give ourselves more effectively because we're taking care of ourselves. And that for me, I think is, is really important in navigating those extremes. I know if I don't look after myself and use essences and, and spend time in nature, then actually, I'm, I'm probably not a very nice person at times, 
So it, it does no one any service for me not to care for myself naturally and, and being tuned with myself, if that makes sense in answering your question. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. It makes perfect sense. And, uh, you know, the key for me, if I had to, to kind of bring it to a nutshell, is in terms of listening to, mm -hmm. to myself. And, and being kind in that listening. So noticing where my, my mind, old patterns of the mind, old conditioning, move into judgment around those very natural needs that are part of being human, uh, that we need to acknowledge and, and honor, particularly in, in times of great change as we're, mm. as we're, in, as we're in now. So just on a completely different tack, but very uh, connected to what we've been speaking about and, and as, a, as our closer, um, your name, Carly's Garden, there's such a beautiful story <laughs> around how that name or what you share came about. So would you like to share that? Yeah. Um, so like Artemis, I have hounds. I can actually hear one in the background at the moment. He's getting a bit annoyed because he can't get to me. Um, Carly uh, was a rescue lurcher. Um, and, and when I got her, she was about 14 months old. She was absolutely terrified, especially of men. She was a whirling dervish, really, very destructive. She was always called Kali, but I actually changed her the spelling of her name after the Hindu goddess. Um, but, you know, it took a long time, but with lots of love and patience, she became the most beautiful, beautiful companion. Um, and I was devastated when I lost her. Um, and, and I just wanted to honour her, really, in, in that absolute archetype of, of transformation through love and through care um so yeah that that's why you know she she had to be part of my business name really um and it's a welcome to enter that garden of transformation um for for anybody really um but she she was a great sort of light bringer to to that idea um really so yes that's that's where the name comes from to uh, to honor her transformation to show she there is always a way for all of us to transform. Mm, so so beautiful and such a a statement for that Artemis archetype, mm. you know, in you and and your work. So powerful and really you know so moving because it takes such a commitment to to work with that kind of animal nature, whether it's in an, a, a, a dog body or a, or a human body. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So and thank I, you so much, Karen. Thank you, I really honor and appreciate your sharing this time and space with me and exploring Artemis. Thank you, thank you for the opportunity, Cassandra. Mm -hmm.